Hi, you're watching a very special session of Agendawani because we have an American in the house and a very nice American because he's going to you know, take us through very nicely of what the election 2016 in America is all about. It doesn't matter who you like, Trump or Clinton, we're going to spell it out, the reality of the situation on ground. And it's good to get insights from there. Is none other than Carl Kondek, Director of Communications, uh, Managing Editor also for Sabato's Crystal Ball from uh, the University of Virginia Center for Politics. And uh, Carl has been a journalist for quite a long time, went to a journalism school. And um, a lot of writings that you have done about the elections, and you're still relatively young, you could even by certain definition be quantified as the millennials in America. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you don't like it, but I like it. Uh, reminds me how old I am. But um, talking about age, Barack Obama just took the world by storm. It was unprecedented. We thought it would be a new benchmark all over the world. But now, post Barack Obama, looking at his successor, most probably it's going to be either Trump or Clinton. And where's that new hope of green growth vigor that Obama promised? What happened, Kyle? You know, what's interesting is that when, when Barack Obama got elected, I think that that was, a lot of people sort of thought that that was a turning the page to yes. a new generation of American leadership. You know, Barack Obama is only in about his mid-50s, mm -hmm. and yet here we have an election where the two people likely to become president are both roughly about 70 years old, and so we thought that the, the era of the baby boomers in American politics was Go over, ahead. and yet they come roaring back in the form of, of Trump and Clinton. So... If we look at that, maybe we should go back all the way to the you know, nominations and stuff and uh, let's tackle Trump first, the Republican. Um, he was not really from the candidates being talked about by the senior party leadership, yet he sort of came out of nowhere and just planted himself there and then just wrote the wave of the support. So what's notable about the current uh, Republican Party is that, unlike the Democrats, the Republicans don't really like their own party's leaders. And at this particular point in time, they don't really value government experience mm -hmm. in terms of who they like as their candidates. And Trump is someone who did not have any support from the party leaders, which, again, is rare for someone who goes out mm -hmm. and to win a nomination. Uh, and also he's someone who'd never run for office before. And yet he was, he was kind of the right man at the right moment in the Republican Party. Uh, and he was able to, uh, to ride that sort of anti-establishment wave to the, uh, to the Republican presidential nomination. Does that, does that point to the strength of Trump on what he's doing right? Or does that point to the weakness of the succession planning leadership, of senior leadership, in the Republican Party? I'd say, I'd say both. I think that Trump did have a, a message that resonated. Uh, he ran a strong campaign in certain ways. Uh, but also, I think that what happened was there were, at one point, there were 17 different Republican candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, the leadership never coalesced around an alternative to Trump. And so even though Trump may or may not have had majority support in the party, uh, he had a, a big block of supporters, and the rest of the many candidates were fighting for scraps among the other mm -hmm. group, uh, amongst the other non-Trump Republicans, and no one ever emerged who could credibly challenge Trump, and so Trump ended up winning the nomination fairly comfortably. Is it a personality thing also? Because that's a big deal in America, maybe lesser to these parts of the world. Yeah, American politics, particularly presidential politics, can be kind of uh, personality driven, mm -hmm. and certain candidates that may be more charismatic do a little bit better. Uh, Charisma comes in all sorts of forms. I think mm. that Barack Obama was charismatic yes. in his own way, mm. and George W. Bush and, and uh, Bill Clinton. And I think Trump is also kind of a charismatic leader. Trump also has portrayed America as a country in a state of decline mm. and uh, portrayed himself as kind of the indispensable man who can sort of ride Change in that. and fix the country's many mm. problems. Uh, and I think that there was some, uh, certainly some openness to that message uh, in, in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. How would, you, you know, if you're just in America, you know, being so close to the election race, then maybe that's a different perspective. But now you have to travel outside, speak to people like us in Malaysia. And how would you see the messaging of Trump's campaign now, now that you have to explain the presidential race and what he stands for to the people outside? 
So uh, I think that American politics, and this is before Trump, uh, is defined in, in large part by race. Uh, we have an electorate that in this coming election is going to be about 70 percent white and 30 percent non-white. That 30 percent non-white non number. Non-white Americans. Non-white Americans, yeah. So African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans. Uh, and that 30 percent block is the biggest it's ever been. So the country is getting more diverse. Mm -hmm. And Trump, in some ways, represents some resistance to the changing uh, demographic graphics in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Trump has run kind of as a nationalist candidate. Mm -hmm. um, he's probably going to do very poorly amongst non-white voters, probably even worse than Republicans mm -hmm. typically do. Mm -hmm. Just to put it in perspective, Mitt Romney, the 2012 Republican okay. nominee, won not, uh, white voters 60 percent to 40 percent, mm -hmm. but he ended up losing because Barack Obama got 80 percent of the non-white vote. Okay. And we could continue to see that kind of gap in American politics. And so I would say that, that race continues to be a big issue in American politics particularly because the electorate is so is so polarized on uh, on racial lines mm -hmm. but this is the biggest democracy in the world where freedom of the press freedom of information and you know you could argue on different things but you have to settle it somewhere and the court system has been there for hundreds of years so forgive people like us for looking at that and thinking like if it doesn't work for America to have a more cohesive approach to nation building, be it within an election process or otherwise, then where could we have that? Well, so the American system is, uh, there's a lot of checks and balances in it. There's the, you know, the executive branch with the president, legislative branch with the Congress, and the judicial branch with the U.S. Supreme Court and the uh, lower uh, federal courts. And they all kind of keep each other in check. And so sometimes uh, that checks and balances system can uh, impede action on certain issues. Mm -hmm. It can be hard to get big picture things mm -hmm. done in the United States. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if one of those institutions sort of goes off the rails, mm -hmm. uh, the other two are there to sort of rein them in. And so uh, in some ways, we have this system that is kind of clunky. But on the other hand, it does prevent uh, overreach from certain from okay. certain branches of the of the government. Mm -hmm. We're going to the first break, but once we are back, you know, Barack Obama make history, but this has been no female president ever. So Hillary Clinton is bidding for that. Problem is, she's not looked upon as a younger America cho American choice. So, but conventions being conventions that they are, maybe that's enough to push her through because it doesn't matter what the younger Americans think. But if the rest vote to the status quo that it's supposed to be, then Hillary would probably be the next president. What would that be like? And why is it that Hillary was still the best candidate from the Democrats? And why is it that Bernie Sanders tried but was not good enough uh, to become an alternative? Maybe because he's also not giving a fresh perspective and being young. Uh, I don't know. Kyle Condick will share that with us right after the short break. It's always it's always good to have social media because you can stock your interviewees' uh, social media. And I saw some of Kyle's um, <laughs> Twitter uh, commenting on the U.S. Uh, race, but. Um, if I look at Clinton and I look at certain uh, new things that are coming into the newswire, there's been call for the emails and more transparency there. But if I go back uh, maybe a few months, um, they, we've known about the emails for quite some time, even for people outside the United States. And uh, usually you would want a candidate that all, is almost untouchable, you know, nothing much to, to really draw him or her down. But still, there's only Hillary Clinton coming out as the most viable Bernie Sanders tried. How did that went on? How did that go on uh, for the democratic uh, process? Because you might have a different perspective looking at it from the inside. Maybe it was Hillary all along because there's nobody else much to take her place. I think it was Clinton all along. She had a very big polling lead, uh, particularly leading up to the kind of the portion of the race where the candidates would, other candidates would decide whether to come in or not. Uh, Clinton just 
had built kind of a, a formidable lead, and she also had a ton of establishment support in uh, the Democratic Party. A lot of the elected members of the House and Senate uh, supported her. And unlike the Republicans, uh, the Democrat, Democratic voters are likelier in, in these current times to uh, be, be more respectful of their own leadership and also prefer candidates who have a lot of experience. And Clinton does have a lot of experience in public life. Mm -hmm. She was first lady of the United States. She was a U.S. senator. And she also was secretary of state yeah. uh, during Barack Obama's first term. So Bernie Sanders kind of entered the race in part because no one else was going to. And mm -hmm. I think he wanted to sort of keep Clinton mm -hmm. honest mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe pull Clinton to the left a little bit because Sanders is arguably the most liberal member of the United States Senate. In mm -hmm. fact, he's not even really a Democrat. Yeah. He's elected as an uh, in independent socialist from the, the small, very left-wing state of Vermont. Okay. And so in the, in the campaign, Sanders probably did a little bit better than, than many expected, uh, but Clinton was the favorite the whole time, and she ended up winning pretty, quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. Why was it that Bernie Sanders managed to, you know, be an irritant to the well oil machine of Hillary in certain states, for example, because uh, it's like almost somebody who was not really given a chance, but suddenly, hey, we've got to look at him. So Sanders had a lot of support from the youngest voters who tend to be uh, more liberal, and I think they might be kind of tired of, of the Clintons uh, in general. Sanders also raised a very impressive amount of money, and okay. he did so through yeah. small donor mm -hmm. uh, fundraising, basically just sending emails yes. out. The money would just pour mm -hmm. in. And so interestingly, despite the fact that, that Sanders was running against the, 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 the mighty Clinton machine, Sanders actually ended up outspending Clinton on television advertising okay. in many of these contests. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the Clinton campaign probably could have spent more if they were more worried about losing the nomination, mm -hmm. but I think they felt like they had a pretty good grasp on it uh, for the whole time, even though Sanders was able to stay in the primary process basically until, until the end of the, uh, the primaries in June. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, again, Sanders uh, had a lot of uh, a grassroots support. He had a lot of support from younger voters, uh, and uh, he was able to raise quite a bit of money. So it ultimately was a pretty impressive campaign, again, even though Clinton was the favorite the whole time and ended up winning uh, by, by a fair amount. The mood of the country is very important during any election in any country. So whoever takes the White House after Obama would not have an easier job because the world and the dynamics of the world is changing rapidly. And uh, the president might be looking at, you know, going down the slope rather than going up, especially as economic prowess is look at China and India is coming up very strongly, it might not be really overtaking America in many fronts. But the signs are there and there are clear uh, signs of that. And how would the mood of the American electorate be looking at the bigger picture of the world? Because now, even though you erect next somewhere because of the social media, maybe you can't even escape that because even if you go into the internet and you still have, you know, you know about other stuff nowadays, would that, would that push really the left to go more left and the right to go more right? And how would a would-be presidential winning candidate be looking at this spectrum and where would they be pitching their general average messages in light of that? So the country is becoming a little bit more ideological over time. Uh, the Republican Party has become more conservative over time. The Democratic Party also has moved to the left a little bit. I think that, that Clinton got pushed to the left by, uh, by Bernie Sanders. Okay. and. Trump, in some ways, is not quite as conservative as the mainstream mm -hmm. Republican Party on certain economic issues, but he's certainly conservative on issues of immigration uh, and, and race in the United States, frankly. Um, I think the next president, whoever, whether it's Clinton or Trump, is probably going to come into office fairly damaged because both of them have pretty poor favorability numbers in the United States, um, it, just amongst the broader electorate. Uh, Clinton is viewed favorably only by about 40 percent of the public, viewed unfavorably by 55 percent or so. Uh, with Trump, it's a lot worse. He's only viewed favorably by about 30 to 35 percent of the public, and he's viewed unfavorably by about 60 to 65 percent. So these are two unpopular candidates. And also, uh, we're probably due for some sort of economic downturn in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, we've actually had a, a record streak of monthly job growth, and once you start to get into a record streak, it probably suggests that mm -hmm. the streak's going to end at some Somewhere. point. Who knows when that will be? 
but it's quite possible that we'll have at least something of an economic downturn in the first two years of the next president, uh, and that person may be coming into office fairly unpopular already, and so uh, it could be, there could be kind of a sour mood uh, greeting, uh, greeting the next president. Okay. Let's go for the last break, but once we are back, let's benchmark that also against global happenings. And uh, no matter who the American president is, there are key issues that has not been solved maybe for decades. Americans uh, led wars in the rest of uh, parts of the world, like the Middle East, for example, Afghanistan. What would the change be? For anyone who's, who's going to become the new president, what about the global economy and how do you open up trade? And when we look at what Trump is saying, we're not sure whether he's really for open trade and uh, how that's going to be. And uh, in your talks here in KL, uh, at events, you have I have also touched on uh, TPP and uh, that has been quite contentious right here in Malaysia because of the awareness and understanding versus reality of it. Plus now we're hearing that uh, if it doesn't get passed by the lame, de uh, lame duck sessions, well, as you call it, the, the last sitting uh, term for the president plus the Senate and the House, it, in not, it won't be passed anytime soon by the new ones. So, where do we stand in all this and how do we get a perspective into that? We'll talk with Calco a bit more after the short break. We have only a few minutes left with Carl Kondik and he's been kind enough all the way from America to give us an overview of the American uh, or US elections and uh, two, maybe one of the two most unpopular candidates for the US president. But whoever sits in the White House has to look at the world too, not just America. And uh, when I was there being given a briefing by the uh, State Department or the rep in Washington, they're saying that you know, practically the White House look at two things. The rest is looked upon by the states themselves, which is uh, actually the international economy and global trade and also defense and security. And if we look at these two, I think this is the most challenging time ever for both because when we look at security the threat of terrorism and you know it's happening here and there it looks like we don't really have an answer right now to stop it from happening and then when we look at global trade you know people are grouping themselves into regional blocks and whatever else but um, the most ambitious which is the TPP Trump and even Clinton has said that they're not for it so how would you see these challenges based on these two fronts for the next US president? So uh, President Obama uh, still supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I know is very important to the government here in Malaysia and also in Singapore and other, other uh, countries in Southeast Asia. So the idea is that after the election, uh, the, the old Congress will meet before the new Congress takes over in January. Uh, Obama will still be president. Uh, his, pre his successor will take office in January. And the hope in the Obama administration is that the so-called lame duck Congress will pass the TPP uh, and Obama can sign it before he leaves office. If it does not pass in uh, November or December, it may not pass at all because the new president, uh, be, be it Clinton or Trump, says that, uh, that, that they will oppose that trade agreement. And I think that uh, the, uh, the Obama administration sees TPP as very important to uh, the United States standing in this part of the world uh, because, you know, we've been so involved in negotiating this treaty. Uh, in some ways, uh, maybe the United States has actually gotten a good deal. At least some of the governments here think the United States have gotten a good deal. And if we don't follow through on that treaty, Maybe some of the countries in Southeast Asia, instead of looking to the United States for uh, open trade, might start look to some of the United States rivals um, for international trade. And so uh, that's something that I think the, the administration is, is sort of keenly aware of, and they really want to make sure they get this done before Obama leaves office. Mm -hmm. From the security of the world perspective, would you think, 
either Trump or Clinton really will make a difference for what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and Syria. So Clinton is basically running for Barack Obama's third term. And, you know, she also is a Democrat. I think there'd be a lot of continuity between his administration and, and her administration. So if you like Obama's foreign policy, you'd probably like Clinton's foreign policy. If maybe you don't like Obama's foreign policy, maybe you wouldn't like Clinton's. Uh, but I think that you know, a lot of governments across the world value uh, kind of stability and predictability from the other countries. And I think that Clinton, again, would, would offer some stability and predictability. Trump's a little bit harder to, to handicap. He has kind of, um, he's been a kind of a more inward looking candidate in mm -hmm. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. He's actually used the term America first to describe his foreign policy mm -hmm. and has, has really based a lot of his campaign on opposition to, uh, to free trade and other kind of internationalist uh, uh, agreements and those sorts of things. And, and there's some question as to whether the United States would be uh, as, uh, as, as, as aggressive in the world mm -hmm. under Trump as maybe mm -hmm. it would be under Clinton or Obama. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I think our uh, the United States rivals, particularly Russia and China, look at Trump, maybe they see someone who they could push a little bit if Trump was, in fact, in office and maybe would see how Trump would respond. And so, again, a lot of continuity with Clinton to Obama, Trump a little bit harder to, to figure how he would act if he was president. Mm -hmm. Before we end, um, because you could be grouped into the millennials of the American uh, segment of society, and uh, sometimes when I'm uh, in New York and Manhattan, I, I feel like it's not representative of uh, the whole America. Sure. It's the same thing for Silicon Valley, you know. People don't care what color of your skin or what religion you have. They just look at ideas and what's the next big thing after Google and stuff like that. But uh, when will we see America moving up to that average rather than maybe Ohio or maybe any other state? Because uh, the parts of America that the rest of the world are exposed to are not really reflective of the majority of America. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the urban areas in the United States are very democratic, very liberal, very diverse, uh, particularly those on the coast. Uh, but then there's a lot of America that is uh, whiter and more conservative. The country is becoming more diverse over time, both, I think, in terms of internationalist viewpoint and also just, just on race. Um, but the country, the, uh, America is still a, a majority white country. It really won't be majority uh, or it won't be majority non-white until maybe the, uh, the middle of this century. That's at least what the um, political demogra or the, the demographics okay. sort of argue for. So there continues to be kind of a, a split in terms of in terms of the outlook. Okay. And we see that reflected on our politics, particularly a, a split between young and old and also between non-white and white and educated versus non-college educated. Okay. So if you have to make a call now, Trump or Clinton? I think Clinton is the favorite in this election. Okay. That's what the polls are telling us. Okay. And I think there are a lot of other factors that sort of argue for her as a favorite. Does this thing called Skype? So even though you're there watching closely the race towards the end of the year, we will Skype with you to know more. Thank you so much, Kanko, for you. making time to be on. Again, Nawani, thanks to you for watching. Send in your own views through all the social media platforms that we have, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or download our iOS and Android applications so you can give your critique and watch your favorite show right on your favorite gadget. Good night and goodbye. Thank you so much.